One of the biggest lessons I learned early in my career was you have to make people feel your messages in their gut and not just intellectually understand them in their head. And the reason that's so important is if they feel it in their gut, the chances of them acting on that message go up uh, exponentially. Hi, podcast listeners. Welcome to Mind Your Own Business. I hope you enjoy the honest business advice and personal stories of mistakes and magic. I'm Sue Stiles, your host and business expert, and I am here to share hope and practical and proven tactics to build your business. Hey, all the steps to success and twice the grit. Visit me for business resources, advice, and offers at suestyles.com. And now back to the show. Welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast. I'm your host, Sue Stiles. And today, please turn up the volume. I wonder if you can guess who we're going to be listening to. He has been given Lifetime Achievement Awards from the American Marketing Association, the Advertising and Design Club of Canada, and the Television Advertising Bureau. And he's been inducted into Canada's Marketing, Advertising, PR, and Communications Hall of Fame. He's the beloved host of Under the Influence, the podcast on CBC Radio, and on Sirius Satellite, and streaming on iTunes, Spotify. Did you guess? It's Terry (laughs) O'Reilly. A household name, I'd say, and Canadians have been enjoying their morning coffee with you on CBC Radio since 2005. And I have to just say, when I received your email back agreeing to be on the podcast, I happen to be in BC um, helping my aunt do some work. And I said, oh, Terry O'Reilly just emailed me back. And she just almost fainted from shock. Oh, Terry O'Reilly, we know him. We listen to him every weekend. Uh, So you've been doing podcasts and winning awards for them since before podcasts were even cool. And if there's anyone who has some answers for entrepreneurs trying to market themselves, it's got to be you. Welcome, Terry O'Reilly. Well, hello, Sue. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, my privilege. And let's just get right into it because I know you have so much to share. Is there anything that's just on your mind right off the bat for entrepreneurs, you know, more solo business owners who might feel, you know, very, very brave and, you know, they're the president and CEO of their company, but their marketing budget or their marketing is very timid and and insecure? Well, I always say on my show, and I've said it in my book, Ad Nauseam, Sue, that small marketers need to be bold. You can't be tentative. The riskiest marketing is safe marketing because it's invisible. So if you have a small budget and your marketing is in the safe category, in other words, if it doesn't make your palms sweat a little bit, when you look at the idea, you're probably not being seen. You're probably throwing your marketing dollars away. So what I always say is you need a great strategy for your company, a great marketing strategy, and that's your lighthouse in the fog. So when you have a bold idea, in order to make sure that that idea is a good one, make sure that it lines up with your strategy. Because if it doesn't line up with your strategy, it might be wrong. It might be wrong tonally for you. It might be just a bad idea. It may be bold, but it might be tasteless. In other words, your strategy will keep you in the right direction, but the the message has to be bold. Even if your message doesn't change every year, that you're really offering the same product or service, you need to find fresh ways to communicate that. And that's the job of creative people like me when I was on the agency side, is trying to come up with fresh ways to deliver the same message every year. And that is never, never easy. (laughs) <laughs> no. And, you know, we were just driving back from the mountains this weekend, and I noticed several billboards, which have got to have a big cost. Maybe someone's paying ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for this big, splashy billboard. And I think some entrepreneurs are spending maybe some money on the space, but they're obviously not spending anything on creating you know, the content. And I know you you talk about most consumers, you know, we hate marketing, or at the very least, find it annoying, as you say. And I think, is that because maybe we're spending money on the space, but we didn't spend any time or money on the strategy? Yes, 100%. 
and on the creative expression of that strategy. And I think, Sue, billboards are one of the biggest uh, violators of great work. So many billboards I see, because you know we see them all over the place, it's such bad design for a billboard because a billboard really needs seven words or less and it needs a big idea because people are passing by at, you know, at 80 kilometers an hour. So it's got to work like that. And so few billboards in particular have that immediate hit or make you smile or make you think it just can't be information. I mean, one of the biggest lessons I learned early in my career was you have to make people feel your messages in their gut and not just intellectually understand them in their head. And the reason that's so important is if they feel it in their gut, the chances of them acting on that message go up uh, exponentially. If they're just processing it into intellectually, the chances of them acting on it are very slim. And the only way you can make somebody feel something in your advertising is it has to be bold. There has to be an idea you have to make people look at your product or service in a fresh way. There has to be some reaction to your message, not just a passive acceptance of it. Well, you're talking about story, I guess, in some way, but how does an entrepreneur come up with an emotional message? Is there any kind of a formula or a step-by-step -step that they can work through? I think... The way you can always arrive at what that whatever that emotion is that's attached to your product or service is ask yourself how it affects the person who purchases it. You have to look back at your product or service through their eyes, not through your eyes, because entrepreneurs always have their nose too close to the glass, right? So you, they fo it fogs up the view. You've got to go outside your place of business and look back in through your window. So, you know, Michelin was probably a great example of that. Uh, for many years, and I don't know why they abandoned this, this great selling line, but for many years, their line was, they showed a family or a baby on a tire and it said, because so much is riding on your tires. And that was such an emotional pitch for a very boring product. I mean, tires are a distress purchase. You only buy them when you absolutely have to because they're so expensive. Yet they found the emotion in it that this one inch of rubber is between your family and the road. When that was presented to their advertising agency, they so smartly just dug what, so what does that mean emotionally to a family? That means safety. So when everybody's selling tread wear and, uh, you know, white walls and what, you know, whatever the, the, the trimmings of tires are, Michelin isolated a, a place where they could live and, and they, they hooked it and hung it on an emotion, which was keeping your family safe. Mm. And I think that's a great example of, how to find the emotion in a product. And that's strategy, right? One of the other stories, Sue, I mentioned in the book about great strategy and how strategy can change a business was with Coffee Crisp chocolate bars. So you know, there's a lot of chocolate bars on the market. They're all about how you know sweet it is or um, what a great treat they are. Coffee Crisp did this great exercise, which I um, recommend to all entrepreneurs. They, they took recipe cards and put them up on a big board and put all their competitors' names on one on each recipe card and then what how they position themselves in the marketplace. And when they looked at them all, they realized that almost all of them were in the treat category. They, all, they positioned themselves as treats. So Coffee Crisp decided to not do that. And instead, they positioned themselves as a snack. And if you remember, the slogan for that, uh, co for Coffee Crisp was Coffee Crisp, a nice light snack. By positioning it as a snack, Sue, they made they put it in people's lives in a different place. A treat is once in a while. A snack is daily. You can have a snack, you know, between breakfast and lunch, between lunch and dinner, while you're shopping, after a workout. Like a snack feels like it's giving you something. A treat feels occasional. Yes. When they made the switch from treat to snack, which is just a strategy change now, their uh, sales exploded. That's just with strategy beyond Incredible. even the messaging, right? Yeah. I happen to have had a coffee crisp this weekend. <laughs> so it is top of mind. I love that you do outline that exercise to put note cards with all your competitors. And I remember doing that a few years ago and lining my wall and trying to have that madman brainstorming session yeah. here. And 
highly encourage anyone listening out there, if you haven't, just spend some time looking and don't be afraid, you know, to dive in. Now, you've done so many um, ads and worked with big brands, Pepsi Canada, Tim Hortons, etc., like you were saying. But when you're creating ads for corporations versus an entrepreneur, you know, if, if the business is you and you're a realtor, a mortgage broker, a massage therapist, a butcher, is there a difference or do, is it the same strategy, this, the same kind of way you're trying to get to a good ad? I think it's the same. When you when you break it all down, I think the methodology and the thinking is the same. With a big corporation, they might have multiple products. You know, if you think about Ford, think about how many cars and trucks Ford sells that are all skewed to different demographics, right? So you've got scale when you're talking about a corporation, but when you're talking about a, an entrepreneur with a single product or service, it's still the same fundamental fundamental marketing at work. In other words, what's the strategy when you put those recipe cards on the wall or on the screen of your computer? And remember what the, the gist of that exercise is. It's putting all your competitors up on the wall, writing down how they position themselves, and then you're trying to squeeze your card in between them. In other words, you're trying to find a place you can exist that doesn't overlap them, which Coffee Crisp did because everybody's treat, 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 and they, and they just stuck their card in and said snack. So that's that's what you're doing. You need to know the the lay of the land in your in your category and in your marketplace. Who, what's stepping on your garden hose? I always used to ask clients that when, whenever I had our first meeting with them, saying, "What's stopping the flow of revenue in the market for you right now? Is it a competitor that's been around longer? Is it a competitor with deeper pockets? Is it that nobody truly knows what your offering is? Like, what is the thing? Because if you can if you can identify the obstacle, then you've got a target. Then you know what you have to overcome. So it all begins with strategy. My radio show, Interesting Sue, when it began in 2005, was really about creativity because I was a creative guy my whole career. And then if you look at the arc of the show, it has very quickly morphed into a show about strategy. And I know as a writer, as a copywriter, I always love to get great strategy and I rarely got it. In almost 40 years of advertising, I can probably count on two hands the amount of times that I was given a great strategy to work from. Most of them were just boring and first level thinking. So what would be an example of a good strategy? Well, Coffee Crisp was a great strategy. I did for many years the uh, advertising for fiberglass pink home insulation the client gave me one of the best briefs of all time, Sue. He said, I sell the world's most boring product. People put me between the walls of their home and never think about me again. Make me famous. That was his brief to us, which was maybe the best brief I think I ever had because it made us laugh for starters, just because he was so bold to say, make me famous with the world's most boring product. But we did make him famous. The strategy was was interesting, but we eventually came to it. It was two pronged. One was for pink, that it was the only insulation mark on the market that color, which is an interesting. You could leverage that. And the second thing was we looked for the emotion. So where we ended up was a line that basically said, "Our business is making sure you save money by insulating. What you do with the money is your business." And then we just showed really funny things where people would buy a tiny, they bought 262 beautiful pink flamingos in their front yard, like crowded them with, or they bought a tiny little pool that they can invite their friends over with. It was always something funny that they did with the money, but the emotion was you have a little bit of extra money now to use that you can treat yourself with. So even a boring product, Sue, the world's most boring product can still be creatively, the opportunities to do something creatively with it can be huge. It's so interesting to hear it. I have your book here. If you're watching on YouTube, Terry O'Reilly, this I know, Marketing Lessons from Under the Influence. Um, fabulous. Highly recommend. And one of the things I was hoping you could just speak to a little bit, and I think it's very hard for entrepreneurs because, you know, we're in the forest. We can't get out of it, is you ask people to recognize what business they're really in. What business are you really in? Oh, right. well, I'm a business coach or I'm a realtor. I give massages. But what business are you really in? 
That's why that's the first chapter in the book, Sue, because you, if until you can answer that question, your marketing will never be relevant. So what business is Molson really in or Labatt? They're not in the beer business. They're in the party business. Every single ad, every single brief I ever got when I was working on Molson and Moosehead and, and Labatt, and I've worked on so many beer brands, it's always sociability. In other words, it's about getting people together and having fun with your friends. It's about a party. So Molson's in the party business. Nike isn't in the sneaker business. Nike's in the motivation business. Just do it is, a, is saying that if you have a body, you're an athlete. And the Michelin's not in the tire business, as I mentioned earlier. Michelin is in the safety business. So until you can answer that question, that's the first thing an entrepreneur should ask themselves. What business? Because you're never selling the product. You're selling the benefit of the product. There's a line that I always quote, Sue, that people don't buy three-quarter inch drill bits. They buy three-quarter inch holes, right? Yeah. So if you apply that overlay to your business, be it a product or a service, that will force you to ask that question, what are they really buying? What are my customers really buying? And when you know that, that informs your strategy and that eventually informs the creative expression of that strategy. Yeah. Oh, that's just so interesting to hear. And I can even feel the authentic, like this works. This is what you have to drill down to. Another thing I thought was interesting that you do say also customer service is marketing. Yes. Just customer service. So what do you mean by that? Well, I think in many companies, customer service is either seen as something that is reluctantly given. Okay. Meaning, and I'm, by customer service, I mean, going beyond the basics, going beyond just saying, thank you for, you know, thank you for shopping here. Uh, can I help you? I mean, it's going above and beyond the call, figuring out ways to make your customers really happy. And I think the best marketing of all is how companies treat their customers. Because when I am treated especially well, Sue, I am always amazed because of how rarely it happens, mm -hmm. where it's above and beyond the call, where someone just they offered me more than I, I expected, or they were they went above and beyond the call in helping me with something, or they literally got back to me when they said they would. Like all of those little things, it's, it's all the little things, right? Yeah. Uh, that becomes your greatest marketing. So I think in bigger corporations, the customer service department should be really speaking to the creative department on a daily basis, that they, there shouldn't be silos there. And I think in a small entrepreneurial company, sitting down and dedicating you know one or two days a month minimum to how can we actually deliver better customer service like that should be an ongoing planned thing in your calendar that you sit down with your either yourself or your small staff or just someone you can bounce ideas off of that's in your life and just say what are two things we can do this month in the customer service department that we haven't done before oh, i think you've hit on also something that maybe people don't take that time to look at their business and work on it because they get so busy working in it yeah. and then they they forget that whole marketing that whole marketing piece i was just remembering um and this is i think customer service too when you provide your customers a laugh or a moment of brevity but uh, you talked about was it the a super bowl when coca cola had their bears reacting to the yes. game in real time. And you said when the Pepsi commercial came on, their competitors, the bears all went to sleep. So and funny. I mean, would you say humor is one of the best forms of marketing or is it just when it's appropriate? It's a case by case basis. The answer to that question depends on what your product is and how how easily humor can slip into your tone of voice. But I specialized in humor my whole career. So if you wanted a funny commercial created or directed, you would come to Pirate, which was my company, because I just happened to specialize in that. I think humor is the great shock absorber of life. And I think that all advertising is an intrusion. It's an, like no one sits in front of their television to watch a commercial. They're watching a show and then a commercial interrupts that show. I think humor takes the squeak out of the door, if you know what I mean, when the, when the commercial is trying to break in. In The Age of Persuasion, the first book that I co-wrote with Mike Tennant, 
there's a chapter there called the great unwritten contract. And what we mean by that is there is this unwritten contract between advertiser and consumer. And that is, if you will sit still for our 30 second message, we will give you something in return. That something can be a smile, a laugh, information you didn't know before. It can be a bus shelter. Like a bus shelter is made to, to create, to hold advertising, but it also gives shelter in, in bad weather, right? Mm. There's something given back in that scenario. That's why people are so angry at billboard advertising as a rule, because they don't get anything back from that, right? Television advertising revenue supports the programming. Newspaper and magazine advertising supports the editorial. Like there's always something given back in the scenario. Billboards, nothing. Seeing ads in a movie theater, nothing because your ticket prices didn't come down when ads went in. So I think every advertiser has to honor the un a great unwritten contract. Oh, that's very insightful. I hadn't thought about that, but yes, I can feel that you're right. Yes, the age of persuasion in that book, I was thinking how entrepreneurs are able to take advantage. We live in the age of persuasion. You know, you, you can put your message out there all the time, anytime, whatever message you want. But you said one interesting thing that I, I want you to just touch on that timing is persuasion. How can we take advantage of that? I'm glad you brought that up because I think there's a great marketing opportunity in that. In other words, when is the ideal time for someone to receive my message about my particular product? You know, there's been a lot of great examples of that over time. So what would be, a, let me just think of one. So Hellman's Mayonnaise had a great idea uh, that they did, I think, in South America, where the thinking of this blows my mind. When you're in the grocery store and you came up to the cash and you're going, you know, your items are being put through the cash, some computer software that Hellman's, and you had Hellman's in the in, as one of your purchases. Once it's detected Hellman's was one of your purchases, it, it quickly analyzed what you had in your shopping uh, cart. And when you got your receipt, it gave you an actual recipe for dinner that night using whatever you had in your cart and Hellman, Hellman's mayonnaise as an ingredient. Like ex extraordinary thinking. But the timing of that was so great because people, most, a lot of people shop at around dinner time. And what's the worst decision of the day for everybody in the world? What are we going to do for dinner? Right? What are we going to totally. make for dinner? So that was a great example. Um, Dr. Scholl's. I mentioned in the book, they were creating in insoles that made uh, shoes more comfortable. And they were uh, advertising to women because when women wear high heels for great periods of time, it's hard on their feet. So what Scholes did was they put all the ads inside the washrooms of nightclubs. And they knew that Women wear high heels to nightclubs, but they knew that women go into the washroom, not to go to the washroom, but to take their shoes off, to just get like a 15 minute <laughs> break on their heels. So that was timing and that was placement. They just, they could have put their ads out in the world and in magazines, but they chose to put them in places where people were actually in the moment having foot pain. So that's about timing, right? <sighs> Yes, that's a good one. Hey, you have another funny one of advertising in a washroom by Virgin. Um, do you remember that ad? That was, yeah. So Virgin is a very creative marketer. I, I love everything Virgin does. They have such a huge share of mind in the airline business, but they're a very small airline in relation to Air Canada, United, American Airlines, et cetera. And the reason they have such a great share of mind is because of their marketing. And Richard Branson being the epitome of that brand. Let me just think of that funny ad that he did in the when you flow an economy and you're squished in economy and you finally land at your destination, especially if you've come overseas, if you've been in the plane for six or seven hours, the first place people go to when they get off the plane is to the washroom, usually. Because when I get off the plane, I never go to the first washroom in the in the airport. I go to the next washroom because the first one is crowded always. Oh, yeah. So, people are right. going to the washroom, right? So they put a, a urinal up on the wall above the urinals. Like they put a urinal like about eight feet off the ground. And uh, there was a little sign under it that says, need more leg room? Fly virgin next time. Like it's such a funny, I mean, 
imagine like, again, timing, right? It's like, yeah. I'm going to the wash. I've been cramped for eight hours on the plane. And then I see need more leg room fly virgin. It's just such funny, funny, smart. It probably cost, you know, I don't know what the air, airport would charge for just having a message, but the actual putting the urinal on the wall probably cost $300. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just the brilliance. It's yeah. not the and the humor. Not, yeah. Yes. I think that was so I can imagine men telling their wives, you gotta see this. Right. Right. <laughs> Come on in. Your most recent book is my best mistake, and where you go behind the scenes, which is what I love reading. You know, you're always talking behind the scenes, how yeah. people came up with this, but you go behind the scenes to some big mistakes people make. I wonder. Is there one or two actual mistakes most entrepreneurs make when we're trying to do our own marketing? I would say one of the biggest mistakes small entrepreneurs make is that they don't look for their greatest area of opportunity. In other words, they might buy advertising, let's say on four radio stations, but they stretch their budget thinly on those four stations when they could have chosen two and bought heavily. That would have been their greatest area of opportunity. Or maybe it's maybe there's just a place where most of your customers congregate. Maybe there's just, that most of your marketing should be there rather than scattered across all different kinds of mediums. Mm -hmm. If it's social media, which is such a great opportunity, by the way, for entrepreneurs, because until social media arrived, you had to pay big money to, to be in front of people. I mean, television, magazine, newspaper, those are not inexpensive vehicles. Suddenly social media shows up. You can spend money on social media, but you don't have to spend money. You just have to spend time. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't spend time on social media. In other words, they should be posting daily. Before you go home, there should be a little sign on your desk that said, did I post three times today? In other words, you're looking to create a relationship with your customers. If you look at the social media sue that Under the Influence does, for example, on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, look at the conversation we're having with our listeners. It's, it's a back and forth constantly. People are commenting on shows. They're giving me show ideas. Like I'll see something that'll say, hey, Terry, I was just in Germany on vacation. I saw this billboard. I thought you'd like it. And then I would have never seen that billboard otherwise. And suddenly that's, that triggers an entire episode idea for me. It's, it's a constant conversation. It's not me. So because we engage in a conversation so constantly with people on social media, that we're creating our relationship with our listeners, when it comes time for me to sell, in other words, when I have a book to sell, for example, I can do that because most of the rest of the year I'm talking to them. So they'll mm. accept the sale. If I only sell, I'll lose all my listeners, all my followers, and I'll just, it'll be, I'll be invisible again. Uh, that's such a great point. I, I know I had a client last week who asked me, you know, Sue, I don't like being on social media. I don't like wasting my time on there. You know, my business is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, do you think I really do need to continue being on social media? And I said, well, no, you don't have to be, but if you're not going to be marketing on there, then what is your alternative? What's your other plan? What's your other big idea? Of right. course, there's nothing, you know, but people just feel if they don't enjoy it themselves, then they don't want to use it. And then they're missing out. They are. And you know what, Sue, if you think of social media as a waste of time, you have to recalibrate your thinking. Because if you th rethink about what you do on social media, for example, I'll post stuff that has nothing to do with our show and nothing to do with marketing. I'll just post a funny sign I've seen somewhere or I was getting on a plane once, I think in, uh, might have been Yellowknife. I was giving a talk up there. And as I was going through the security line at the airport, there was a big sign when you got right to security that said, no bear spray allowed on plane. You know, that's, <laughs> I've never seen that sign in an airport. So I would just post that. I mean, I'm just forever just posting interesting things. That, and what I mean by that is it's fun. Mm. It's fun to post fun stuff. And it's just what happens up in my daily, day-to-day -day business. I'm just being observant and I'm looking for opportunities. And, and the whole thing is fun. It's not a task. It's not a time suck. If you're thinking of it that way, you're thinking of it 
incorrectly. If you're not on social media, like you say, Sue, where are you? What's your plan B? Let's hear it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so good to hear from you too. I was on your Instagram this morning and it is very engaging and it feels nice. It feels like you. It feels like, well, yeah, that's Terry, who I listen to on podcasts, who I have an experience with. And now, I mean, I feel like we're friends and it yeah. continues on the social media. Now, the challenge for everyone is how do you take that, you know, and use it for yourself in that way? It all speaks to your brand. Social media is one channel, right? And as a matter of fact, it's it's several channels because what you do on Twitter is different than what you do on Instagram, which is different than what you can do on Facebook. So, yes. you know, Instagram is very visually, visually oriented. Twitter's, you know, kind of timely news, 280 mm -hmm. characters, although you can use links. You can put a lot more information in a tweet than just 280 characters. Facebook, there's a lot of, a lot of chit chat on it. So a brand is the sum of everything you do and you should design every moment. So what does your website look like? And is there, you know, my shish kebab theory, Sue, that, you know, a shish kebab is a piece of chicken, a tomato, a mushroom, a green pepper, a piece of pork, but it's got all on a skewer. And the skewer is the important part of that. So it, it, the same thing applies to your marketing. Your, your shish kebab is your website, your business cards, your social media, your, your mass media, your, you know, all, all, but what's the skewer? In other words, are you bringing consistency to all your different channels? In other words, are you using the same color scheme everywhere? Are you using the same tone of voice? Is there a design element you can bring to all of it so that when people see your work out there, see your ads, people never see everything. You can never assume they're seeing everything. You're seeing a little portion of your, of your communication. Are you giving them ways to connect the dots? In other words, when they see, they hear a radio commercial that's interesting and funny, and then they see uh, a really uh, interesting Instagram post, and then they see a little tiny little newspaper ad that's still got an idea. They go, oh, that's that company I keep seeing. I yeah. I'm going to check them out next time. Like, it's just connecting the dots. Entrepreneurs, the, one of the biggest mistakes, getting back to your question, is every piece of advertising feels like a one-off. Mm. That's one of the biggest mistakes small companies make. Everything there's no dis, there's no connective tissue between everything they do, so it all goes out into the ether, and there's nothing that connecting it and 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 you know making a collective brand statements. If I'm to be use lofty marketing language, that's a key observation for sure. I hope a lot of people out there like me, aha moment. Yes, I I see that. And so in your latest book. My best mistake. I, I'm sure a lot of people are afraid to make mistakes, yeah. are afraid to do something that people won't like. But you've got some stories of how some of mistake, some mistakes have turned out to be the greatest marketing ever. Most of those stories aren't about marketing, actually. They're more about career mistakes and they're more about mm. catastrophic career mistakes. The reason I wrote that book, Sue, is I wanted people to know that everybody makes mistakes in their careers and in their, their companies. Some mistakes are huge. Uh, some people run from their mistakes. And then there are the successful people that embrace their mistakes. And that some of your biggest mistakes may just be the best thing that ever happened to you. So the first chapter in that book is about the movie Jaws, Steven Spielberg's movie Jaws. It's a well-told story where everybody knows the shark malfunctioned during filming. And then uh, Steven Spielberg had to very quickly figure out how to salvage the film. And he did that by not showing the shark till the end of the movie, which made it even more suspenseful and dramatic. But I think what was interesting about that story was why that mistake happened. And which was when he had the animatronic shark built and he tested it out in Hollywood, he didn't test it in salt water. He only tested it in fresh water, in a freshwater tank. That's why it malfunctioned. That was the mistake he made. Once he realized the mistake, that once the salt started corroding all the animatronic mechanics of the shark, and he realized the shark was not going to function, he was on location with his crew, with his cast. In his first big shot at directing a Hollywood movie, he sat in his hotel room one night in the dark, panicking. And then he asked himself this very interesting question. He said, what would Hitchcock do? 
<laughs> by recalibrating his thinking like that, he realized that what we can't see is the most is the scariest thing of all. So that's where he uh, arrived at the solution, which was don't show the shark. And the shark, the, we only see the shark. I, I can't remember the exact minute count, but I think we only see the full shark, Sue, for four minutes in that movie. That's astounding, right? Because yes. in your mind, you think you've seen it for two hours. Yes. Part of that was the great score that John Williams wrote. The way you could only see a dorsal fin and a tail fin. and like It was just such a smart solution to this catastrophic mistake that Spielberg made. And he says in hindsight, that mistake added like a, like $40 million to the box office or something like that. So the reason I wrote the book was I wanted people to know that mistakes can be, there can be huge silver linings inside a mistake. If you peel it like a banana. And I learned this in my advertising career too. If you, if you have a problem you're trying to solve, the solution is sitting at the heart of the problem. In other words, if you can peel it like a banana, you'll find the solution as, as opposed to going elsewhere for the solution or, or thinking, you know, leaving your problem behind and trying to solve it by using borrowed interest or something that the actual major solution is sitting at the heart of the problem. So ver very quickly, a great example of this was the uh, top engineer at Audi uh, said to his engineering staff one day, how can we win the 24-hour Le Mans endurance race if we can't build a faster engine? So the Le Mans race is one of the uh, most uh, heralded auto races in the world. And whatever car brand wins that race is really held up as the best car brand in the world that year. So winning it is, is incredibly important for brands. And the way brands won it historically was they, tweak, they you know, managed to tweak out a couple more horsepower in the engine. Mm -hmm. But he said to his staff, how can we win if we can't build a faster engine, which is an incredible challenge. And his staff came back with this brilliant solution. They came back with an engine that required fewer pit stops. And by having fewer pit stops, Audi won the Le Mans for the next three years in a row. And I think that kind of solution to what seems like a, an insurmountable problem is what is like the, in other words, they peeled it like a banana. The solution was in the engine. It just wasn't in the horsepower. Mm. Right. So I think the great lesson of that book was when you look at all those different stories of people having these catastrophic career, the criteria in my book was they brought it on themselves. Like, you know, Spielberg should have tested in salt water and Mario Puzo shouldn't have borrowed money from loan sharks, which led to him scrambling to find a book deal and then end up burying the Godfather just to get money. Like all of those, that if you just peel the problem like a banana, you'll find this incredible opportunity waiting at the heart of the problem. Mm, that's so inspiring. Terry O'Reilly, thank you for sharing a moment of your time here for everybody Listeners, if you aren't, if you're the one person who isn't listening to the podcast right now, please go and enjoy his podcasts. You can find lots of info about Terry and his speaking business and his books on terryoreilly.ca. And where can we find you all on your social media channels? Well, uh, at Terry O Influence. So at Terry O Influence, you'll find Twitter and uh, Instagram. And then searching under the influence on Facebook, you'll find us there. Well, I sure enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you for taking the time and uh, have a good rest of your career. I look forward to seeing and hearing everything else you put out. Well, thanks, Sue. I, I enjoyed our, our talk. Thanks for having me. Please follow and review if you enjoy these podcasts and then visit me at suestyles.com.